So today we're continuing in our series for Advent and focusing in on the child who changed the world forever. I invite you to look at the back of your program. There's an outline there. We're also going to be looking at John chapter 1, one of the Gospels in the New Testament. So open your Bible app, get to John chapter 1. We're going to be focusing on verses 6 through 9, but we're actually going to read uh, verses 1 through 18. As we think about the first Christmas and we reflect back and we see that not only did that Christmas change the calendar, change our daily way we record time, but it also has dramatically changed people's lives forever throughout history, throughout God intervening, God making himself known. And so today we pick up the story of a a witness to the light and we're going to be reading from John chapter 1. And I invite uh, Charles Morrison to come up and read God's word for us today. And so as we um, traditionally stand for the public reading of God's word, I invite you to do that along with Charles as he reads verses 1 through 18. Thank you, Charles. That the beginning of John refers back to Genesis 1, where God said... Chapter 1, verse 1, at the beginning, God expressed himself. That personal expression, that word, was with God and was God. And he existed with God from the beginning. All creation took place through him, and none took place without him. In him appeared life, and this life was the light of mankind. The light still shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never put it out. A man called John was sent by God as a witness to the light, so that all who heard his testimony might believe in the light. This man was not himself the light. He was sent simply as a witness to that light. That was the true light which shines upon every man, which was now coming into the world. He came into the world, the world he had created, And the world failed to recognize him. He came into his own world and his own people would not accept him. Yet, whenever men did accept him, he gave them the power to become the sons of God. These were the men who truly believed in him. And their birth depended not on natural descent, nor on any physical impulse or plan of man, but on God. So the word of God became a human being and lived among us. We saw his glory, the glory like that of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. And it was about him that John stood up and testified, exclaiming, here is the one I was speaking about when I said that although he would come after me, he would always be in front of me, for he existed before I was born. Indeed, every one of us has shared in his riches. There is a grace in our lives because of his grace. For while the law was given by Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. It is true that no one has ever seen God at any time. Yet the divine and only Son who lives in the closest intimacy with the Father has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. Great. Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you so much, Charles, for reading God's word for us today. We some of us have nativity scenes in our homes. It's not uncommon to see them out in public as well. And you look at all the cast of characters that are there. And yet here today we have John the baptizer, John the Baptist. And I don't know if you can see it, but I got a little picture of John kind of sneaking in on the side here. Right. Because I mean, who has a John the Baptist figurine in their nativity scene? Anybody? But yet all four Gospels record the importance of having John the Baptist speaking first, proclaiming. God had been silent for about 400 years as far as prophetic speaking. And then John the Baptist comes on the scene. As you receive your Christmas cards, take a close look at them. wonder if any of you will receive a Christmas card with John the Baptist featured John the Baptist's message, awaken, God is speaking, wake up, God is being proactive, 
Will you see anything like that? I guarantee you, you'll see manger scenes. And so as we take apart this text today, I want to encourage you that John the Baptist's message is so important in this Advent season. In fact, if you don't hear to the depth of your heart and soul the message of John the Baptist, then this little baby Jesus born in a manger is not very important to you. It can't be. Because while we admire this innocent God create God in the flesh, as our word tells us, he was born to die. And so that's the piece that John brings forward. He, he brings forward the world's great need. You know, we live in an area and in a country right now that is so opposed of everybody. There's so many differences. If, if you were to take a poll or even ask here in this room, what's the world's greatest need today? You would probably say for our government to do something productive, or you might say we need to watch the environment, or you may point to something like education. We need better quality education. You may even point to the environment, that there's disasters happening, or wars that are in our world. There needs to be for universal peace. There's all kinds of things that people could point to what is our world's greatest need today. But yet John who walked and talked with Jesus, who, who followed his ministry, who was charged by Jesus to be uh, procl proclaiming the gospel, says it this way. According to the gospel of John, the world's greatest need is a belief in Jesus Christ. He wrote his gospel to show that. And we look in chapter 20, verse 31. This is why John wrote this gospel. This is why he recorded this whole book for us. To show that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's, that's the core of the whole book of John. And so as we unpack this here today, there, I mean, there are legitimate concerns about other needs within our world today. And as Christ followers, clear back into Genesis, we are charged with being caretakers of this world. Jesus said it best when he said, a new command I give you, that you love one another. That love permeate anything and everything we do. The love of Christ. Only that love is the one that's able to radically transform our life and the lives of others. So John the Baptist appears here. There has been no prophetic voice for 400 years. As you will close the Old Testament and open the New Testament. Yes, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke. John is writing later at the end of his life. He is summarizing some of what the other gospels did not record. And so he's bringing this all together. He doesn't go through the details about the Christmas story, but instead tells us the importance of why. Now, if you look at some of the other gospels, you'll see that John the Baptist has a very critical role and they fill in a lot more things. And one of them is about his being a voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way of the Lord. That's verses 22 and 23 in today's text. John the Baptist was a voice. He was a witness. He was a witness to the light. See, spiritually speaking, Israel was on a track of religion. They were practicing. When I say God was silent, it doesn't mean that he abandoned everybody. He still spoke through different people at different times. The temple was still going on. It became more and more greater to the point where the temple became the whole focus. And that's when Jesus breaks in on the scene. So you've gone astray. You've developed a way of religiosity that I'm not a part of. You've lost me in your ritualism. And instead, I want you to recover. I want you to re-embrace. It's not about a religion. It's about a person. And that person is Jesus Christ, born in a manger. And this is what the people desperately at that time needed to hear was a fresh wind, a voice of God Almighty speaking. And so as we dig into, well, what was the Baptist's witness? If our greatest need is to believe in Jesus Christ, then what a blessing it really is to have a John the Baptist appear on the scene. 
Oh, he was very unique. If you look at him, he lived in the desert. He ate locusts and honey, and he wore camel's hair. He wasn't very attractive in that way, but his message was powerful, and his witness was powerful. And you notice in the text, verse 6, there came a man who was sent from God. He didn't bring this out on his own. God had prepared him out in the desert for this message, and he came as a witness He came as a witness to speak about what was going to be happening. John is the Baptist as a role with witness to Jesus. And Jesus said in uh, chapter 535, he was a burning and shining lamp. That's John the Baptist. And through his witness, many of John's disciples began following Jesus Christ. You know, there are there are times in your life and maybe you're in one Right now, we go through the regular routine of life and all of a sudden something happens. Maybe it's a tragic event. Maybe it's just something you read and an awareness comes over you. Or maybe it's a song you hear on the radio or, or on your playlist. That just God breaks in. Just like here, it was silent, but God broke in. God chose John the Baptist to be a voice to speak into the lives of Israel who was off doing religious stuff, but missing the creator, missing Jesus the Christ. Is that you? Because that can happen in our lives, too. We get so stirred up and focused on what we're doing and the things that call our attention. And all of a sudden, something happens. God breaks in and you have a choice. When God breaks in like that, you have a choice. You can ignore it. You can keep on going your own way. You can misinterpret it. You can see it as punishment. You can see it in a variety of ways. But listen, God is trying to get your attention. And so with a framework in place, when God speaks, the best thing to do is to observe. Observe what he's saying. Observe what's going on. Reflect on what it is that he's saying. And then talk to others about it. Say, hey, I'm going through this experience. And I'm, I think I'm hearing God speaking to me through his word or through a song or through a person. And, and I want to play that out with you. What do you hear? What do you say? See, in community, we then define what, what God is saying. And then you put together a path of action. If this is what God is saying to me, then what am I going to do about it? How am I going to proceed? Maybe it's a promise that he wants you to remember. Maybe it's a a course change in a direction in your life. Maybe it's an opportunity for he's just saying, I'm here with you in the midst of this mess. Don't miss me. I have intention. I can make something beautiful out of this chaos. Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Maybe it's just a sense of his comfort and his presence and his love. But maybe it is a chastisement. Maybe it is a a point where you have done something that you maybe are ashamed of, but it's hidden. And God breaks in and and you want to hide. You want to cover it. You want to avoid it. You want to deny it. All those things. But yet the Bible tells us if we confess our sins... God is faithful and will forgive our sins and redirect us and research. Our God is a God of fresh starts each and every day. That's the witness's testimony. That's what what John is saying. You know, it's interesting. The unique thing about John's witness was about him um, baptizing people. Verses 24 through 27. Now, some of the Pharisees, these are the religious leaders of that time had been sent to question John, the baptizer. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. And of course, he's talking about the Christ. And we see, as we read through later in the story, that John the Baptist actually does get to baptize Jesus Christ. He says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, what's unique here is baptism wasn't unusual to the children of Israel. They saw Gentiles get baptized all the time. What's unique 
is that Jews were being baptized. And that's why these religious leaders came to say, what are you doing? Because this idea of repentance, this idea of God breaking in and changing your mind or direction, changing a course, this is already the start of what Jesus is going to face, of a religious system that is pushing back against anything that's going to interrupt their flow of religiosity, power, money, all that stuff. And so they're already saying, why are you baptizing Jews? They're the chosen people of God. And John says, listen, notice how he directs it to Jesus. Don't focus on what I'm doing, but focus on the one that is here among you, Jesus the Christ, even beyond what John is doing. Because see, for all of us, God is holy, and we're alienated. It's in our DNA, the sin problem, clear back into Genesis. But then again, our own issues, our own brokenness, our own tendency to do what's best for me, not follow the command of God to love one another So if you meet and greet this Jesus that's born in a manger, this Advent season, you need to deal with John first. John the baptizer. See, the moment a person comes to understand the reason of Christ's life, death, and resurrection, and trust Jesus alone rather than our own efforts to be right with God, they witness that by baptism. And we baptize people here at New Life. Acts, 1, Acts 19 explains that John's baptism, the, the John the baptizer, looks forward to Christ's coming. But as Christ followers today, as Christians today, we look back on the work of Christ on the cross. So all of this is about a true light. And I've got a picture here. It's not an actual photograph of Jesus being baptized. But I want to advance you forward in the story about John the baptizer baptizing Jesus, the one who he said he's not even worthy to untie his sandals. But Jesus Christ is the true light that John is talking about. And he helps us see the way to God and shows us how to walk along that way and journey this life of faith. You know, there's a couple of things there that stood out for me is that the world did not recognize him. The world did not recognize the true light, Jesus Christ. That's that's all the other world religions. That's all the Gentiles. That's all people outside of the, the Jewish community. They did not recognize the light of the world. But then he goes on and he says, neither did his own. Well, who is that? That's the Jewish people. That's the, that's the people you would have said, those are the faithful believers. Those are the ones that are practicing relationship in God. Those are the ones who go to the temple and read their Bibles or hear their Bibles being taught. Those are the ones who live in authentic relationship with God, but they're missing it. What are they missing? They're missing Jesus the Christ. And so that's our encouragement for us today is don't miss Jesus. Don't miss Jesus in the hurry and the hustle and the bustle of today. John is confronting people. They have a spiritual need. And God was wanting to act in their life. And we have the same for us today. It's throughout our our journey of faith. Again and again, we're reminded of these precious verses right out of John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. In a way, that is the message of John as a witness to the true light. John was a witness to the light, but now it's our turn. Because we're called to be witnesses to the light You know, a witness is basically somebody who says, I saw or I experienced, I was a part of. And that's all you're called to do is how are these verses real in your life? God is a giving God. He's a sending God. We believe and we have life through his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we're to be witnesses to that. 
John 1, 7, verse 7 says, John came as a witness to bear witness about the light. And so what are we witness to? Christ. That's the first thing. I know so often it's easy to say, watch my life. Look how good of a person I am. You should be like that. That's not what John did. And you want to be careful with that. We should live moral, right lives. But listen, even as your pastor, I'm going to stumble. And I'm going to have problems. I've got issues. I've got my own brokenness that I deal with. And praise God, he has transformed me in so many different ways. And I'm not stuck in some of those patterns that are ingrained into me. But God has broken free. God has given me life. But I still stumble. And if, I point, if you hold me on a pedestal, don't be too disappointed when I fall off. And the same is true for us. Instead, point to Christ. You know, I've heard it said the church is filled with hypocrites. And I'm like, yep, praise God for that. Because uh, we all, you know, we want to speak so strongly to who Christ is and how the difference is. But boy, sometimes it takes one little piece and people will say, see, see how worthless your faith is. And the reality is, is no, see how important my faith is. I need I need to be reminded all the time of how terrible my sin is, how my tendency is toward selfishness. But then how am I rescued from that pattern? That's the reality. How am I rescued from that pattern of sin in my life to break out into a life of faithfulness through Christ, the Holy Spirit living in me, and live that life out of gratitude? See, I can never earn or deserve his love, but he gives it freely to me and to you. This is the message of John the Baptist. And so our goal as Christ followers is to co- encourage others about that. We're not the light. Jesus Christ is the light. He will never leave you. He will never fail you. He will never fall off that pedestal. He is perfect and without sin. And he is forever the ever pursuant lover. That's the word What matters in life then is not who we are or have been in our past and how God is transforming us and the trials and the challenges that we face. The real challenge is that Christ shines in the darkness and in your life. So how can we be sure to have that faith? How can we be sure to be ready when things come off the rails because they will in your life this side of heaven? We live in a broken world. Bad things happen. I just want to say there's a couple of strategies that have worked for me, and and I know they've worked for others. I've heard them. That is get in the Word. Stay in the Word. Don't neglect reading God's Word. Andrew shared about a new devotional he started. We have devotionals out there for you for this season of Advent. There's things online. There's things on your phone. If you're using a U version, there's all ways of tools to equip you to get into God's word on a regular basis. The challenge is we don't. We're busy. We forget other things. And then so all of a sudden things happen and we wonder, what? See, you have to guard your faith. Because when you're talking about light in this world, there are a lot of things that will be attractive and shiny and glittery and try to draw you to the false light. But Jesus Christ is the real, true light. Commit yourselves to prayer and worship and even discipleship. Commit ourselves to regularly worshiping together in the body of Christ, not only on occasion. Because when your faith seems to fail you in that time of need, I'll just ask you, well, have you been too busy to study God's word? Have you been too busy to pray? Have you forgotten and neglected your life of worship in the family of God? Then it's no wonder you're feeling the way you feel. But you know what? God doesn't punish us for that. It's only one step back. Sometimes when God intervenes and breaks into our world, it is through challenge, struggle, and difficulty. I just encourage you to tend the precious gift of faith. That God has given you personally. 
And then as we close this, a witness to the light. Have you offered yourself as a witness, reflecting that true light to Christ in a dark and dying world around you? God sent John the Baptist in that time. And Jesus says, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. So I want to encourage you, the opportunities are there. Ask God to open up those doors for you to be shining and reflecting the light of Christ in this Advent season. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the message of John the Baptist. Sometimes it's one that roughs us up a bit, but yet it points to the necessity of God becoming flesh because you did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And so, Father, we thank you for your love for us. Help and strengthen us in our walk with you. Those who may be struggling, Lord, strengthen them, encourage them. Today is the day that you are breaking in to send them on a new course or a different direction, to restore them. And I just want to give you praise for that. Your Holy Spirit is working in this space. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen.